I get a little pop up letting you know that we are now recording. Welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube afterwards. So this webinar, as I said, is being recorded. We always share these on our YouTube channel afterwards. So usually they're up within about a day. So if you want to go back and watch any of our previous webinars, if you enjoy this one so much, you want to go back and watch it again later, please check out our YouTube channel. Give us a follow on there and then you'll get to see every time we post new videos on there. So I'm not the only one that shares videos on there. We've got a lot of really great stuff. So please definitely check out our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A box. That lets everybody else see your questions. Also makes it easier for us to find them afterwards. We'll answer as many questions as we can get to at the end of the webinar. Um, for your safety, you should only be able to see anything I might post in the chat, but just in case I missed a setting or something, please don't click links other than what I may post for your own safety. On the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered free to the public, but we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you're going to be magically taken to a page with a bunch of resources on things that you might be interested in, like our native plant guide, our rain garden guide, stuff like that, um, but also our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help keep us running. Uh, there's also a box you can check to become a member, and then you can enjoy all our variety of members only stuff. And also to sweeten the deal, right now we have a grant running right now that's going to match all new donations through the end of the year up to $75,000. Mm -hmm. So if you were thinking about donating, now is a great time because if you donate $25, we get $50. If you donate $50, we get $100. So this is the perfect time for you to double the impact of your donation. So thank you so much to everybody who has donated to us so far. Um, as you know, we've been running these uh, every week, and next week we are going to be joined by NICOR Gas and American Water, representatives from those companies, and we're going to be kind of switching gears. We normally talk about outside conservation. Now we're going to be talking about inside conservation, so how to save energy and water and money too. So join us next week to find out more about how you can do some conservation inside to help save the planet outside. All right, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to my friend and former co-worker, Kate Caldwell. Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Kate Caldwell, and I work out of Plum Creek Nature Center at the Forest Preserve District of Bull County. Um, and I'm really excited. Jamie was really awesome to invite me to present on bats. And she mentioned in the, with the poll about bat hikes. Um, and we had one bat hike this year and we had a couple of them last year. And they're a lot of fun. Um, we, and it's all based on our volunteers that, uh, in fact, I couldn't do it without them. Our volunteers who have done bat studies and we actually did a bat study uh, back in 2018. Um, so they're always joining us. They have the bat um, re uh, recordings that, that they play back when bats sing beyond our hearing and it goes through this piece of equipment called the echo meter and then it's available to us in, in human hearing. And we also look up and bats are flying all around us. So best time of year to hike for bats is in the uh, summertime, really, when, when insect populations are up and uh, mom bats and baby bats and the daddy bats are all out flying around, uh, gobbling, gobbling, gobbling up insects to get ready for winter. So as um, far as the Forest Preserve District of Will County goes, um, I follow the mission. I live by it every day. I've been working at the Forest Preserve for so long. I eat, drink, and sleep, the mission and the motto. And the motto is to reconnect people with nature. And in my brain, that's like a common thread that goes through every action of every day to keep connected to nature because nature just isn't here at Plum Creek Nature Center. It's not just out in your yard. It is the blanket that protects us and the planet. Um, so everything that we do um, is connected to nature. And um, sometimes our actions don't look like that, but uh, we try. So um, our mission is to protect, enhance, and conserve our natural and cultural heritage through education, recreation, and restoration. 
That's what we do here on the Forest Preserve. In Will County Forest Preserves, we have uh, comprises about 4% of Will County, and we have about 70 different preserves. Um, and most of those you can come and visit. We have trails that, that allow you to hike, you can bike. Um, if you have horses, some of the trails are, are horse trails. And some of our bike trails interconnect with other county trails and even state trails. Um, so we have lots and lots going on. If you like to camp, if you like to picnic, or if you just want to, especially in this time right now, just kind of decompress and come outside, um, our forest preserves are here for you. So um, I mentioned that, I don't know if you picked up on it, but I said that our forest preserves are 4% of the land in Will County. Um, the other 4% is covered by Medewin, and that these are rough guesstimates, but pretty close. So 8% of the land in Will County is nature. It's that blanket that is supposed to cover all of us and protect us, but it's only 8%. The other 92% is us because the forest preserve, everything is protected within forest preserve boundaries. Uh, when we are doing restoration in there, we're putting it back to pre-settlement times before people were coming across the ocean and starting to develop the land. We at the forest preserve are putting this land back, restoring it. So when you come in, you're stepping back in time. But guess what? It shouldn't just be this 4% or 8%. Medewin is doing the same thing within Will County. Um, there's the 92% and that's us. And guess what? It is on us to do it. So you're gonna be seeing kind of that common thread of connectivity uh, and the bats are gonna connect you to stuff that we should be doing every second of every day. And what Jamie's doing is wonderful with these Zoom webinars um, to keep you connected and keep you active. All right, so what I'm going to do is start the slideshow. Share screen, go to my slideshow and hope for the best. There we go. Okay. Um, so I am talking about the bats of Will County, but I will be giving you some information on uh, other bats as well. And there is a little bit of a Halloween theme because um, you would think, you know, Halloween, bats flying all over the place. And actually, Bats are not flying all over the place right now because insects aren't flying. Insects usually fly when it's about 50, 55 degrees or warmer, and then that is the bat's food. So where are the bats and what are they doing? What have they been doing? Let's find out. If I can move the slideshow. There we go. Oh, okay. So where in the world are our bats? And you see uh, the Latin name for bats are Chiroptera. Um, and that means a winged animal, winged mammals, winged mammals specifically. And you can see bats in general, just bats in general, this is what they cover around the world. Um, they're in almost every continent of uh, the world. They just don't live where there aren't insects or it's too cold and um, so flying up to the poles or flying down to the poles is not where they are, but they pretty much are everywhere else. And there's two kinds of bats on planet Earth. Uh, we have megabats and microbats. The megabats are, are flying foxes and they're confined to our tropical regions and there's about 200 species. And you can see, um, the Latin name here, um, scientists are trying to be more and more accurate. So I can't even say me Mega Chiroptera is the suborder of Chiroptera. That's the old name. And uh, Ying, Ying Patero Chiroptera is the new name for megabats. We won't spend a lot of time on that. All right. So anyway, focus on that for a second though. Megabats, 200 species combined to tropical regions, microbats which is what most of the bats in the world are, a hundred or a thousand plus species are microbats or micro, micro chiroptera or yango chiroptera. That one's a little bit easier to say. So megabats, they have, what megabats are are flying foxes. Um, they have a wingspan of up to 5.6 feet long. So just think about that for a second. How tall are you? 
Are you about five foot tall, six foot tall? If you spread your arms out wide, that's about your height. Um, and guess what? Like I'm about five foot six, five foot seven. And some of these bats have a wingspan that is my arm span. And these would be our flying foxes. They have really good eyesight. They, their primary foods are fruit and nectar. They don't echolocate for the most part and they live close to the equator. And these are the ones that are 200, about 200 species on the planet. Our micro bats um, are much smaller. We're talking anywhere from 1.25 inches to about 40 inches. Um, and the smallest bat in the world is the bumblebee bat, which is about 1.25 inches, just a teeny tiny bat. I'd love to see that. Or our false vampire bat, which is uh, about, what do they say, 40 inches long, okay? Well, Will County bats average about eight to 13 inches. For our micro bats or our micro chiroptera, uh, their food is different. They're more carnivores. They eat birds, lizards, frogs, fish. Our vampire bats uh, are good at uh, going after cattle and they're very efficient because they just puncture just a little bit to give a, a little bit of blood going um, and they lick it and have an anticoagulant so they can lick the blood. It doesn't really harm the cattle. Uh, most of our microbats, if not all, echolocate to get their food. Um, they are animals more of the night. And most of the microbats, these small bats that you have here in Will County, as well as in other parts of the world, um, they, they uh, live in the Western Hemisphere. And I have on here, it's very scary. They eat other bats. They don't. You, not as much as you would think, but they do. There are some of them that do, and you will meet one very, very shortly. So just to give you a little bat terminolo terminology as I'm talking, um, you'll see words like nursery colonies, bat roost, migration, hibernation, echolocation. Um, just to give you a little bit of definition of these, um, a nursery colony is a group of bats that consist of mother bats and their young, um, a bat roost is just a, a place where bats live when they are active. Um, and I, another, I'll be getting down to another word in just a second when they're not active. And then migration, um, some of our eight bats will fly south to caves and mines and rock outcroppings. Some of them will hibernate solitarily in rock crevices or in big groups um, in man-made structures if they can't find natural structures. Um, and when uh, they will be migrating um, and they arrive to the caves is between December, actually migration is happening right now, and then they will start going into hibernation between December and March. And the temperature needs to be maintained around 32 to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's very, very important. Um, so hibernation, um, when the bats arrive and they're flying down to the places where they're going to hibernate, um, those are called hibernaculums. And um, they, it's, and what the word hibernation means, it's very specific to mammals and a bat is a mammal. And so for the bat, the bat will, its metabolism will slow down. And when they, when they do hibernate, um, it's a response to uh, food not being available or extreme conditions. And in the case of the bat, cyclically every year, um, this is how they have evolved to be. So when it comes to right now, they are flying down and they're getting into their hibernaculums and their heart rates are going way, 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 way down. Their breathing is going way, way down. They're going to stop eating and they're slowly, metabolism is going to be extremely slow and they're just going to live off of their body fat uh, between December and March. Um, they're all Illinois bats are protected under wild, the wildlife code for Illinois. Okay, so echolocation. Just, I wanted to kind of define that a little bit further and it's really cool. Um, bats send out waves or sound waves or sounds from their mouth or their nose. And uh, the frequency is approximately nine kilohertz. 
Um, it can go up to 200 kilohertz. Um, and humans hear around 20 kilohertz. So that frequencies or sounds, um, for the most part, are beyond hearing. And I will be playing a little bit of those sounds in a little bit. Um, when the sound wave hits the object, it produces an echo, and then the echo bounces off of that object back to the bat's ears, and that allows the bat to determine where, how big the object is, and its shape. So it could be a tree, don't crash into the tree, or it could be a moth, something they want to eat. Um, and they can detect objects as thin as a human hair, and this, because of that very excellent detection system, they can eat very tiny insects like mosquitoes. And so here's a great picture of um, echolocation, which you, know, it, you can see the bat sending out that yellow line, and then it hits the moth, and then the moth, the echo then responds back to the bat, hits the ears, their brain processes it, and they go, mm, is that a tree? No, that's food. It's time for me to go in and eat. Um, as far as bat wings go, remember these are mammals, and this is an excellent picture of a bat. It's very simplistic, but it gives you the idea of like, wait a minute, that looks like me. It has arms, it has, which includes like an elbow, it has fingers, it even has a thumb. Here's the teeny tiny little thumb right there. Um, and here's their fingers, and this is all their bat wings pretty much wrap around their entire body like a blanket. Um, they even have five toes just like we do, and they have ears like we do, but they're very big ears that allow them to capture their echolocation. So where are you going to find bats in Will County? in their habitat, of course. So what is their habitat? Well, remember when I was talking about the forest preserve and uh, how we're doing restoration to go back to pre-settlement times and how uh, the forest preserve itself only covers 4% of the land. Well, once upon a time, um, all of our land was covered with uh, oak woodlands, prairies, streams, wetlands, and this was the bat habitat. Bats have been on this earth for millions and millions of years, and just post-glacial period, they, the microbats have adapted to our Will County landscape, all the way up to just a few hundred years ago, when all of Will County was covered with old growth forests, which gave them a perfect habitat. There were no houses, old growth forests that had perfect crevices and cavities and things that they needed to uh, allow them to live. What, where do they go now? We don't have old growth forests anywhere, and yet they have adapted to our ever-changing Will County landscape and houses. Houses kind of replace the, the big old tree cavities and snags that used to be everywhere. Um, so in addition to that, caves, and we do have some caves in Will County, we do have trees in Will County, and you're gonna see some bats that are okay with just the trees themselves, not necessarily the cavities. Um, and they also need a water source of nearby creeks or wetlands and spacious woodlands. And you can see this picture of, uh, this, these are bats that are roosting in one of our forest preserves. This is a great shot. So to keep it simple, for their habitat, our micro bats, our Will County bats, they are carnivores and their food are insects. Their shelter that goes way, way back over hundreds of years should be trees. But now there are houses too, okay? Um, and, the, and the space are oak woodlands. So food, shelter, space. And if you include water and air, it's food, shelter, water, air, space is the definition for a habitat. So their habitat is similar to ours. We need food, we need shelter, we need space, we need air, we need water. Keep all that in mind and how connected we all are. We all share a habitat and just slightly differently. Um, so why are bats in Will County? Because of all of these insects. Um, and keep in mind when I introduce you to the bats, they eat, uh, they're specific. So you might be thinking, oh, bats are great. They eat a thousand insects. One bat will eat a thousand mosquitoes in a night. And uh, that's actually just a couple of different species that are particular and like, and like their mosquitoes. Other bats in Will County 
are, prefer other types of insects. So you'll be seeing that in, the, in a little bit. But the insects that they eat are beetles, moths, flies, true bug, wasps. I keep bringing up that other bats. What is that all about? Okay. Well, Halloween is upon us. Where are our bats right now? Some of them migrate and some will stay here in Will County. All of them hibernate, although there is one in question where they haven't been able to determine where it goes. And um, that is the evening bat, just in case I forget to mention that, I want to introduce that to you. But um, let's just assume all eight of our Will County bats hibernate. So as far as the lifespan and reproduction um, of our Will County bats, um, they can live up to 20 years, but that's an extreme number um, because they live in the wild and there are so many challenges out there in the environment all the time. I mean, they do have predators. There's other animals that like to eat them. Um, so owls will eat them, coyotes will eat them. Um, so probably more around 10 to 12 years. And when do they mate? I love this. They mate in fall and winter. And then females actually, after they're done mating in fall and winter, and this is in their hibernaculum. So when the bats right now are flying to their hibernaculums, the males and females and, and the newborn pups, and the mature females and mature males will be mating very, very soon in fall and winter. But actual fertilization doesn't happen. They don't become, the females don't become pregnant until spring, just after hibernation ends. Um, pups are born in May through June, and that happens after the bats have done their migration back in March, April, May up to Will County. And they re they're coming back when the insects are starting to emerge, when their food is available to them. Because remember, right now, they've eaten as much as they can. They're storing their body fat. They're going into a state of hibernation and living off of that body fat from all of the insects that they ate. So when they come out of hibernation um, in uh, March, they need to come back here to Will County and start consuming insects right away. Um, then, um, remember these females are pregnant, so they're even eating more and more and more. And then eventually pups are born May through June. And I love the term that they use for baby bats. Pups. Um, most bats will, when they reproduce, will reproduce one bat. Um, up here in the northern climates, I've read that they can have twins. Um, but for the most part, it, when you're going to be seeing in other, uh, further on in the presentation, when we start losing our bats, it's not like, well, aren't they like rats or mice where they just reproduce and large numbers, so it's not a big deal if we lose a few bats. It is a big deal because when they make more of themselves, it's usually every year they only have one offspring. That's it. Um, they nurse four to five and a half weeks because they are mammals. They teach the pups how to fly, the females do, when they're three to eight weeks old. Um, maternity colony sizes, depending on the species in Will County, can be two, might be mother and baby, mother and pup, or up to 300 in a maternity colony. Um, and that will include pregnant females, mothers, and pups. Notice the males aren't hanging around with the, with the moms and the babies. Uh, maternity roosts are buildings, loose tree bark, tree cavities. And so when, every time I mention buildings, keep thinking of houses because they do use uh, houses a lot. And where are the males? They usually are not, they are not with the females and they roost solitary in a sol solitarily or separate from the females during, during nursing. So uh, you're about to meet our bats, but before you do, um, I'm going to mention the word habitat because habitat, I love the word habitat because it's not just a habitat for bats, it's a habitat for all of us. The habitat is nature, it's that blanket that covers the earth and is going to protect us and, and save us because that's, we need nature, right? So we're going to be talking about bat habitats in a little bit. Um, and sometimes bat habitats and people habitats are the same thing. So if anyone has any fun stories that they want to share at the very, very end, uh, please feel free. You might have questions related to those stories as well. 
Um, I have a spooky bat story. Um, my uncle, in a couple of years ago, he um, was almost 100 years old. He was, he was getting close to 100 years old. Grew up um, and lived in the house where we were at the time a couple of years ago. And we were kind of rummaging through the attic in this super old house. It's over 100 years old. So you would think the attic would be musty, and it wasn't. We, we got upstairs in this attic, and keep in mind, the time of year was uh, May. And it was in Minnesota. And so we're up in this old house, rooting around in the attic. It's like, wow, I made a comment that the attic is clean and warm. And, and I started pounding on the wooden walls going, you guys, you know how strong the wood is. This is a really, this is a really strong house. And so then we all went walking down the stairs. At the bottom of the wooden stairs, these, just like this picture you see in the lower right, um, a couple of bats were using their thumbs and pulling themselves out onto the wooden stairs. And that's because I had hit the wood and disturbed them and disturbed their slumber um, because they sleep during the day and they wake up at night. So me pounding on that wood scared them. So that's my spooky bat story. And we just let the bats stay in there because guess what? In my uncle's house, those bats probably have been living there since he was a child you know, passing on, passing on uh, the habitat to the next family member after family member generation. Okay, so here we are, we got pumpkins to show you that it's Halloween and uh, we're gonna hear spooky house stories which really aren't so spooky. Um, and we're gonna meet our Will County bats. We have eight bats, big brown bat, tricolor bat, the Eastern red bat, the silver-haired bat, the northern long-eared bat, the hoary bat, the evening bat, and the little brown bats. And all of these eight bats have, what do they have in common? In the summertime, their behaviors are nocturnal. They sleep during the day and they wake up at night not even at night, just when the light is beginning to fade and insects are out voraciously feeding, the bats are out there voraciously feeding on the insects. Um, so what is the commonality of all of our eight bats? They're nocturnal, they eat insects, the females raise young, males stay in separate roosts. Um, they like to live in small spaces, tight spaces or cavities. They during the day sleep and at night, they're out hunting for insects. And then in October through March, um, they are hibernating. And at October right now, some of them are migrating. Let's meet our big brown bat first. Hello. Um, he, as you can see, I'm gonna just quickly go over like, okay, a big brown bat, are you gonna find him in your house? Possibly. He will also, he or she will pick bridges or trees. Trees are gonna be number one. Trees are number one, it goes back hundreds and thousands of years. But if they don't have trees, they're gonna pick uh, mad main structures. In the winter, a uh, big brown bat can migrate, but it can also stay here and overwinter in, in houses. They are very specific, they eat bigger insects like beetles, leafhoppers, moths. There we go. Um, okay, and oh, by the way, look at the distribution of bats. I've also included a map of where the brown bat and all of these bats are. They're not just here in Will County. And you can see that the brown bat goes all the way down into uh, central Mexico and also South America. The little brown bat, specific to North America, and it also is in buildings. Um, it, that one is, as you're gonna see, numbers are in the lower, they're, they're more particular, they, would pref they prefer the wooded areas and they migrate, they usually do migrate and they go down south. And they like smaller insects. They're the ones that are gonna be eating those mosquitoes and other the mosquito cousins that are in the fly family. Our northern long-eared bat. Note down on the bottom that, uh, that this out of the eight, um, this one is threatened in Illinois and federally. And I'm not sure why, except that my guess would be that they are more particular on their habitat 
because habitat has been reduced uh, on the planet and just as you can see in, in the area that it's range, um, it's, it looks like it is having a harder time. So the northern long-eared bats numbers are lower. Um, and its diet, it likes to eat little insects and it likes beetles. What's kind of cool about the northern long-eared bat is that it gleans. So it has a skill where it will capture insects while they're resting on uh, foliage. Hello, tricolor bat. Likes to eat wasps. See, wasps are predators. They're great insect predators. But guess who likes to eat insect predators? The tricolor bat. Um, and they also live in buildings. Uh, but again, pre preferences would be trees, mines, and caves. And this one also does migrate. And you can see that it lives in almost up to the uh, Rocky Mountains on the other side of the Mississippi River and goes down into Central America. And really, when you're looking at this map, oak woodlands. I mean, that's, that's the, the, their range is because of oak woodlands. Eastern red bat. Um, this one is very interesting. Um, besides, look how pretty its fur is. It's just a very red soft fur. They all have fur in their bodies, by the way. Um, and because they are mammals, and um, this one doesn't live in houses. It stays in the oak woodlands and it really stays in the trees. Um, and as far as the forest floor underneath the leaf litter, that is where they, that's where they would go to hibernate. And it says some of them, I guess I've read other places where they do migrate, but where they, where they end up going. And we have, we have found this even in October and November when we're, doing restoration activity in, in our woodlands and the forest reserve. Uh, we have found uh, little red or eastern red bats hanging off of shrubs and they are dropping to the ground and they drop when the leaves from the oak trees are starting to cover the forest floor in the fall and they stay underneath the oak, the oak, the forest floor underneath the oak leaves. Uh, uh, one of our uh, wildlife biologists in Cook County, uh, when he first discovered, he's like, what's wrong with these bats? There's like dead bats underneath the leaves. And then he realized, no, and he, he saw this in the wintertime. And that, that's where they overwinter, is they need that blanket of oak leaves. What do they love? These guys love moths. And you can see their bat distribution uh, is really up to the Rocky Mountains. The silver-haired bat. Um, that doesn't live in houses either. That one lives in the woods, tree bark, holes and trees. That one will migrate to caves and mines. Um, and it says here, when we don't really have large numbers of silver-haired bats here in Will County. Um, if you do see them, it's usually during migration, but um, we have found that they do live here as well. And you see their distribution is all over North America. They really don't go down any further into Mexico. And notice on, I put the habitat for all of these slides just because I want to connect you with going back in time a few hundred years ago. This is their habitat, forests and prairie edges. This is what they come to every single year. And our hoary bat, um, I know you're just waiting to hear who eats other bats. Um, the hoary bat is so cool. Um, when we were on our bat hikes, you could see bats sometimes if you're lucky, but the hoary bat, being that it's the largest bat in Will County, um, its body itself is five inches long. So, you know, is that about five inches? But its wingspan is about 13 inches. And we looked up and the sun was just going down so you could still see like the light in the sky and the silhouette of what we thought, what is that? And sure enough, um, we had our echo echo meter going and it picked up hoary bat. It's like a hoary bat flew right over us. It looked like a bird because it was so big. Um, they like to live in trees and they've actually been mistaken for pine cones. And by the way, the, the eastern red bat also looks like a pine cone because they, they hang off of trees. Um, and uh, they eat beetles and true bugs. And once in a while, I guess they've been known to eat other bats. That's why I put the scary pumpkin picture in. Um, where do they migrate? Unbelievable. They, they migrate to California 
Arizona, Mexico. Um, and you also see that they live down in the southern uh, South America. And I think these guys are permanent residents down there. They're a separate population. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Okay. And last but not least, our elusive evening bat. That will leave in houses. It's possible if you have bats in your house, you could have an evening bat. They're definitely more on the rare side, but more research is needed. We have never seen where their hibernaculums are, where, where they go when they, when they uh, migrate south. We, so we don't know exactly what their habitat is for a hibernaculum or where they hibernate. They like eating Japanese beetles. They've been known to eat Japanese beetles. So um, these guys are voracious insect eaters. And you see the evening bat has a pretty small range. It's, um, most of them are very similar. That big brown covers everything, but evening bat goes up past the Mississippi River as well. So why are bats so great? They just are, because they live on planet Earth with, with us. Let's just end the slideshow right now. They're great because they are part of the food web, just like we are. And they make up an important part. You start pulling little pieces of food web out, the food web is going to collapse. So bats are, are if you want to just look at it from a centric, a human-centric point of view, okay, they, are, they keep insect populations in control for us so that we can have our food. Um, so they, a bat can eat its entire body weight in insects every single Okay, I don't think we as humans could do that because like uh, some of us weigh like 100 pounds or more. Okay, let's just say we're not eating 100, 120, 200 pounds of food a day, right? Just keep that perspective. So bats are eating their entire body weight every day in insects. Um, fun study facts, uh, a colony of 150 bats, all in one summer, they counted 38,000 cucumber beetles 16,000 June beetles, 19,000 stink bugs, and 50,000 leaf hoppers. Wow. Okay, and three, here's another fun fact, 300,000 pounds of insects every night during the growing season. That was another study. Um, so what, as far as like, for us, that is so important. Bats are zooming all over agriculture fields because there are insects out there that like to munch on the crops. Some, and I put pest control in quotes because guess what? Our crops are food for other animals, but the bats are out there going, we got this guys, there's insects on the crops, we're gonna eat them. And they eat the corn earworm and cotton bollworm moths. So um, that, that helps. So really pesticides, they are our natural pesticides. So what did the forest preserve do for bat habitats? I wanted to include this because of our 2018 study, which is why we have our bat hikes, because we got this started and we got our brain wrapped around uh, doing bat hikes and, there's, and people just love them, they're so much fun. So we had our citizen um, bat monitoring program, which is part of our you know, restoration department, uh, trying to keep information on what kind of bat populations uh, are supported in our forest preserves. Um, and so we worked and partnered in 2018 with some other groups. Uh, one of our restoration people um, got this started and got some wonderful volunteers um, who went for the entire uh, summer season um, between June, July, August, and September. Um, and monitor for bats in three different locations. Um, and so this is what they looked like when they would go out at night and they would have to go out like a half hour before sunset in very specific conditions. Um, and uh, here's the very specific conditions. Um, actually, I'm sorry, they went from between April and September. Um, and the specific conditions were temperature needed to be greater than 50 degrees, the wind speed needed to be down, it was like optimal conditions for bats being out and flying around and, and eating insects. That was the best time to collect data. Um, and so with the equipment that they had, here is at the three sites that, that we um, monitored, the big brown bat, the eastern red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bat were the ones that were the biggest in numbers. 
Um, whereas the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, the evening bat, and the tricolor bat were more on the rare side. And I believe it's the northern long-eared bat that is federally endangered and, and state endangered as well. Um, so it was exciting that, you know, they were, we saw them at all. That means that, you know, they probably had, you know, each female had one pup. So uh, hopefully, yeah. Um, okay, so what are threats to our bats on planet Earth? Well, I should probably take that bottom, bull bottom bullet point and put it to the top because human activity is probably um, our biggest threat. If you just say that, you know, it, that's, that's what it is um, because of our habitat reduction. Um, and again, I'm going to remind you about like the amount of space in Will County plus uh, the federal land, uh, if you add those two together, that's 8%, uh, which means 92% of habitat is pretty much not there in Will County anymore. It's all developed. And that all used to be covered with oak woodland. So don't worry, there's stuff that we can do. There's stuff that we can do. So uh, threats that are affecting us, dang, wind turbines, that's supposed to be helping the planet with climate change. And we're finding out that wind turbines are definitely an issue. Um, there was a study that was done on wind turbines where 47,000 bats are killed each year. Um, and that was in Canada. Canada has a lot of wind, time, wind turbines that they're putting up. Reason being, uh, wind turbines, they're only guessing right now because it's all very, very new. Um, but in fact, this study was done in 2016. Uh, wind turbines possibly look like trees to bats because when migrating bats are flying, they usually fly high. They're flying high over the wind turbine. So they shouldn't be running into them by accident. But what they're doing is they're flying down and they're investigating because to them, uh, their echolocation has told them that these are trees. And then they get stuck in uh, the spinning blades and, uh, and, they don't, and they don't make it out. So they are working on some different things uh, because we, you know, 47,000 bats, again, you know, because they only reproduce by having one pup a year in general, uh, that is not sustainable. Uh, white nose syndrome is something that arrived in the early 2000s in the United States. And white nose syndrome is something that uh, comes from Europe. And for whatever reason, the bats in Europe are a little bit more adapted uh, to this disease and, and have the immunity uh, to overcome it. But here in North America, they absolutely do not. And it's, and it's wiping them out. Um, and so it was uh, first de detected in uh, North America, starting in New York um, in the early 2000s. And it made its way into Illinois just a few years ago. But the fungus uh, attacks the bats when they're in their hibernaculums. Um, bats living in tight, closed spaces, um, it, it, you know, they, they're, connect, they're passing on the disease from one to the other. And uh, it can kill 90% of bats in, in their hibernaculums. And so the species in Will County that are most affected are the tricolored bat and the little brown bat, northern long-eared bat and the big brown bat. And that's just in Will County. The Indiana bat, it, which is outside of Will County, is affected as well. So we're keeping our eye on that one. And, and right now, the only thing that we can say to protect our bats is uh, we don't go hiking in the caves because we could pick up a little bit of the fungus and that can be transferred into the cave where their hibernaculum is. and. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of controls that they're trying to work on. Um, and then of course, pesticides. Pesticides in a few ways. Pesticides wipe out insect populations that therefore will wipe out bats. Also bioaccumulation where our bats are ingesting, uh, you know, if, if they're sprays and they're taking that into their bodies, that's gonna affect them. And all of that is gonna weaken them, therefore making them more susceptible to white nose syndrome, you know, and, and other diseases. Um, and of course, habitat loss due to human activity has already been mentioned. 
Um, all right, those scary pumpkins are just screaming their heads off. So they're yelling at you now, saying it's now or never everybody, all of us that are living outside of the forest preserve. Um, every single one of us, whether we have a backyard or we don't, we, we need to make some changes right now. Um, I liked this quote from the United Nations. Um, the statement is for right now, it's not too late to make a difference, but only if we start now at every level from local to global. So um, yes, the bats have spoken. It's not just about bats, it's about everything. It's about us, it's about everything. So every single one of us, like with every action that we take, we need to be stopping and thinking all along the way, you know, how can I be sustainable? How can I help with habitat? Start in your backyards, if you have backyards. And if you don't, you can still do it in so many other ways. So let's talk about backyards. What can you do? Um, if you leave your snags, and I love the word snags, but snags are trees, alive or dead, that have holes in them with uh, little grooves that have been carved in them by animals that have come before the bats, uh, like uh, bark beetles or uh, a woodpecker that's pecking away at the tree, um, or other animals that have lived in there, all of these things, squirrels, all of these animals that have lived in trees and bore holes in trees, Trees, as you can see, they probably have trees in your neighborhood that have holes in them that are still alive. That would be considered a snag and that is a perfect habitat. Um, and there's a great picture over here of somebody that is like, well, how do I leave a snag? And look at this awesome thing. They cut down their tree, but they asked the chainsaw guy to cut it down so that this, the dangerous part wasn't in their yard anymore, but they left the rest and it looked like the chainsaw person did a lot of scarification of the tree, um, cutting grooves into the tree, which is perfect habitat for bats and so many other animals. Just because a tree isn't alive anymore, doesn't mean it's not alive. Snags were once covered all of Will County and all of the Great Lakes region and all of the world. I mean, trees, big old growth forest, snags were an integral part, an integral part of the food web and the habitat. Okay, do you love this next one? Don't rake your leaves, I'm sorry. I know, I have to tell, talk to my husband all the time. He's like, but, but, but what do you mean don't rake leaves? And you already know one of the bats, the Eastern red bat uses that for habitat. And think about it, before raking leaves was a thing, it wasn't a thing. And that was probably less than a hundred years ago. Um, so this whole planet, the whole habitat and having leaves on the ground is part of the food web, is part of the habitat. And animals use that. And that enriches the soil, that retains water. It does things beyond our, our imaginations. So yeah, don't rake leaves. Just let them lay on the ground. Don't worry. I, I, I've got a picture for you. You're like, well, I don't even know what to do with that. But yeah, leave the leaves. Keep your cats indoors. Um, Plants, native plants, big proponent of that. I think all of Chicago region, all of DuPage County, Will County, Cook County, Kane County, get rid of those lawns. Lawns be gone and put in deep rooted, water retaining, carbon dioxide sequestering native plants and build a bad house. Okay, I just, I wanna show you another picture of a snag just so you understand, look at how all of these animals have made this snag what it is. This is a perfect bat habitat right here. It's got all the grooves, everything that a bat would need to roost and in the summertime. This is a bat house right here. So if you must cut down your trees, you always saw, already saw the picture before. I warned you I was gonna be talking about snags. Um, so this is something else that you can do. Yep, again. Uh, when you talk to your tree guy, they're going to think you're crazy because they need to be educated. So educate them and tell them don't cut down your tree. All right. And as far as not raking your leaves, here's a picture of, uh, actually, this is Goodnow Grove. Uh, it's 
fall, all the leaves are falling on the ground. That's a blanket for the winter for our salamanders, our bumblebees, our woolly bears, our spiders, frogs, native bees, the whole food chain, and oh yeah, bats. Now, as you can see, this is a, a nice picture of one of our forest preserves. It's, in fact, it's where I work here at Plum Creek Nature Center, Goodnell Grove. Um, and there's a lot of restoration going on here, lots of spaces in between, a lot of native plants. But this forest is getting ready to go to sleep. The bats are getting ready to hibernate by either staying here and falling into the leaf litter or uh, migrating further south. Now you look down below here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is my yard. And there's leaf litter and there's native plants and there's no lawn. And yes, I had to talk to my husband about this and kind of talk him into it. But uh, So what's happening in my yard, half of it is still lawn and half of it looks like this. But he's starting, he's starting to get hooked because he's admitting, wow, I kind of like the way this looks. Um, so start with your yard. Again, I'm using my yard pictures and I like to call it breathing space. Um, yes, it's breathing space because it's very zen, but more scientifically it's breathing space because native plants are plants that have lived here. They lived here before we developed the land. They are designed for this climate and this, this space here in Will County. They send deep roots, fibrous roots, down into our tough soils that are clay. They, we have extreme cold, extreme heat, drought. We have lots of rain. If you have a native plant system in your backyard, you are retaining moisture. It's not going to flood your basement. My basement stopped flooding. A few years into planting all of these native plants, it was pretty cool. Um, I'm rewarded by the beauty, all the pollinators that are, are in there and the birds, even the overwintering birds because of all the seeds that hang around. It, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. By the way, breathing space, carbon dioxide, sequestration, climate change, okay? Our carbon dioxide's going up. So again, get rid of your lawns, you got to do it step by step. I'll show you how you can do it. Put in plants that will take carbon out of the atmosphere. That's what plants do. They take carbon out of the atmosphere. They send them down into the soil where it can be sequestered for a year, two, or decades, or even a hundred years. And what do they give off? Oxygen for us to breathe, right? So it's a win-win for all of us. Oh yeah. And going back to that beautiful quote from the United Nations, local to global, start right now. And we'll show you how that can be done. Where can you go buy native plants? The first three are, are three that I've uh, had a good relationship with and I'm used to. Um, and my fourth bullet point uh, on the conservation at home website, they also have places where you can go. So Possibility Place in Moni, um, Prairie Moon Nursery in Minnesota, uh, and Prairie Nursery in Wisconsin are the three that I'm used to. Uh, great people to communicate with if you have questions. They have a great website, um, and you can order plants online, especially in COVID. They're really good about, about delivery and stuff. Um, and at Conservation at Home, we also have, there's a really nice list of places that also sells native plants. But here's the thing, make sure, let's say you're, you're out at a box store, like, you know, Menards or wherever, and, or even a nursery. Um, make sure that you ask the question before you buy any native plant. Do they have, ready for this word, neonicotinoids in them? That is something that I heard back around 2010 or so. Beekeepers were getting really upset because it was, it was a, it's a pesticide that is put into, I believe, the seed and it gets into the root, it gets into every part of the plant. And this pesticide kills insects. So if a monarch butterfly lands on the plant, it's a, it's a pesticide that kills insects, so the monarch butterfly will die. Um, and, you know, in theory, it's like, well, that's an efficient way to do, you don't have to spray pesticides anymore, it's right inside. But they're putting them in a lot of plants, including native plants. So you, and that's because of the thinking, the mentality of, uh, 
you know, people don't like insects. So it's a win-win. You have a pretty native plant and it kills insects. No, you don't want to kill insects. Okay. We don't want to, we need the insects. So make sure that you ask that question, be proactive because neonicotinoids are not illegal yet. Minnesota is trying to get laws in place and that's where Prairie Moon Nursery is on top of it. They can absolutely 100% guarantee that they do not have neonicotinoids in their, in their native plants. Possibility place, possibility place in Moni, Illinois can guarantee that they do not have neonicotinoids in their plants. And same with Prairie Moon Nursery. So wherever you go, always ask that question. Um, and native plant sales in the spring are a great place to go at the Forest Preserve District of Bull County. We usually have ours in May, in May at the Sugar Creek Administration Center in, in Joliet. And there's lots of native plant sales, either online or all over uh, all of the counties that uh, Conservation at Home represents. All right. Um, I'm going to move into bat houses. I'm just going to take a look at the time here. Okay, wow, we're getting, I, I did go longer than I thought. Um, so I can talk to you about bat houses, but I'm going to zoom over those. Bat houses are something that you can do. Um, and if people have questions about them, um, I will go into it a little bit. But uh, if you, you can see, there's very certain specifications that I can um, share with you online um, when you look at this. This, I've got, I had to do a lot of research. Um, up here in uh, the northern climate, uh, having bat houses that are not on poles but are mounted on your houses are the best way to do it. And there's very specific uh, things that need to be followed for bat houses. Is it a guarantee when you build a bat house that bats are going to come? No. Uh, so, but this, this is kind of a surefire way if you just follow some of these directions. Um, and there are some very specific things. So I think that I show you a picture. Okay, if you can see in both of these, um, there's a little space beneath the bat house. This one has a space between the bat house. The bat house that I have at home that somebody gave me does not have that, so that wouldn't work. So there's some very certain specifications that you need to do. Also, number of roosts will help. Uh, if you have three of them, um, that's really great. And then painting the color, I have the map for you. Um, tree height, construction, and this is a bat house that we did put up on poles in one of our preserves. So far, no bats are living in there. And it's probably has something to do with temperature. All right, we just have a couple of minutes. I'm so sorry I uh, went as long as I did. And Jamie, I'm open for any questions. That's great, Kate. Thank you so much. That was a whole bunch of information right there. We actually did have quite a few questions um, about the bat houses. Oh, perfect. Um, okay. So, um, let me go are, over it fairly quickly or? Well, let me ask you a couple of the questions and then we can sure. see maybe we can fill in some blanks here. Okay. So, uh, your friend and mine, Barb Ferry, says, I have a bat house in natural wood. I can't put it up in my backyard due to power lines giving the squirrels a beeline to its access. Where would be a good place to put it near my house and should I paint it black? Okay, so I can answer the should you paint, paint it black and here is the color map and Barb, if you are in this area right here, you would paint it a medium gray. Um, as far as where you should be locating it, um, as, I guess as long as you're in an area where there is water, uh, less than a quarter mile away. So uh, a pond, a stream, uh, a small lake, because that is all good insect habitat. Um, mounting it on trees, no, not a good idea. Um, make sure that when you mount it on, and poles also are not a good idea for this climate up here because we have extremes and cold extremes and temperature. Um, make sure that it's 12 to 20 feet off the ground so that the bats, because when they climb out of their houses. They climb, remember the little thumb? They just climb out and then they drop and they need it to be at least 12 or 20 feet to 20 feet off the ground because they drop and then they glide and fly away. Um, and the vegetation needs to be clear underneath there as well. Um, so I did, I, did I answer that question? Yeah, and that's interesting because most of the ones that I've seen put up are, have been put on trees or on poles. Right, so. yeah. It's, yeah, it's and it's, 
Yeah, it's not a good idea for trees because of predators. That's, that's one thing. Um, squirrels, raccoons, hawks, owls. Um, it's, it's just too close to predation to hang something like that on a tree. It's already so, bad for them. So mounting it on a building is actually a preferred? Yes. Yes, it okay. is. Okay. Yes. Um, and going back to, um, oh, somebody had asked about the guano in that case. If you do put it on your house, is there an, an issue with the guano underneath it or how to handle that? I have, if anything, it's a good issue because it's great fertilizer and you're going to have it outside of your house. People so you've got plants that. underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Just stir it into your soil. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then another question you had mentioned that, um, you know, having like three different roosts. By roost, do you mean like separate bat boxes? Yes. So okay. like this bat box right here, if you would put three of them, and I don't have specifications for that. When I saw that, I was like, okay, what does that mean? But I just saw that that will increase the likelihood that you will get bats. Because if you have three roosts close together, maternity colonies uh, happen for some reason. Okay. Um, and Nicole says that they're looking to put up a bat house, but they have some issues with yellow jackets. So are there, is there any advice on keeping yellow jackets out of the bat boxes? Well, we have yellow jackets too. Um, and remember that bats eat insects. So I'm wondering if it's just the placement of the house. So our yellow jacket at the nature center, or our bat house at the nature center faces east. Um, and it's about maybe seven or eight feet off the ground which is not high enough. So the bats didn't occupy it. So the yellow, it's not, actually it's not yellow jackets, they were wasps. Yellow jackets are ground nesting. Uh, right, pests. so probably, probably more wasps. like paper wasps. Right, right. And so they're living in there just because the bats chose not to live in there. So they're, you have to look at all, check all the boxes to make sure that your bat house is in the right place. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Karen asks, if they're nocturnal, how do we see what kind of bats that we have? Because it's hard to bird watch at night. Right. That's what's so fun about our, our night hikes with bats. Um, you really can't tell. You know what, Jamie? I did not do vocalizations, so I can do a That's couple okay. of vocalizations if we have time. But um, the vocalizations that we use when we went on our bat hikes, come. they are captured um, on an iPad through a microphone process through the echo meter, slows down their vocalizations about 10 times so that we can hear it. And then it goes through a sonogram processor and then it identifies specifically what kind of bat it is. So when we saw that, uh, what was the large bat? The hoary bat fly over us. Um, it was confirmed on the echo meter um, because the sonogram went, oh, yep, that's a hoary bat. That's the only way you can really tell, except if you do see a really large bat fly over, you can act like a bat expert and say, oh, that's a hoary bat. Um, otherwise, most of the other bats are about the same size and shape, so they're really hard to tell apart. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I, I know I have seen bats in my backyard. Usually, like, as the sun's going down, it's not totally dark yet. You can see them flying around getting insects because that ha they have that very erratic flight pattern that exactly. just doesn't look like a bird. Right. Um, that's, that's a very good thing to bring up because nighthawks share the same space as bats. So not, and nighthawks actually do the same thing. They're zooming around and eating insects, but they don't have an erratic flight. They're gliding, whereas bats are zigzagging all over the place because their echolocation is so accurate that they're actually flying the flight patterns of the insects. Very cool. Very so cool. As, as we said in the beginning, if you ever get a chance to go on a bat hike, totally do it because it's really worth it. And it's an amazing experience. It really, really is a lot of fun. Yeah, keep your eye. I, I'm sure other preserves will do it. Um, you just need to have the right equipment. And Local nature centers, places like that. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Hey, did you come across in your research, Margaret wants to know if bats have any kind of protection like, you know, migratory birds are protected, raptors are protected. Are bats protected at all? They're protected by state. So one of, in my first uh, couple of slides, yes, they are protected. So it's illegal to uh, take a bat in any way or capture it. Um, the only time that you would need to deal with that is let's say you found a bat in your house and you needed to get it out and there's instructions on how to do that. 
Um, but you're not allowed to, you know, just, uh, if you see a, a nursing colony or, or, or bats living somewhere, like in your house, you're, you're not allowed to go in. If it's like not in your living space, but outside of your living, like in your attic, you're not allowed to go in there and kill them. And there are ways to get rid of bats if you don't want them living inside of your attic. And that's probably one of those situations where, you know, call the professionals. There are professional animal removers who can get them out because, you know, the, from everything that I've read, especially from like the health department and things, if you have a bat in your living space, it's really not a good situation. If you get bit, you have to go through the rabies protocol just as a precaution and it's exactly. not pleasant. And, yeah, and you might not even know that you got bit because their teeth are so tiny and sharp, you right. may not even realize that you got bit. Right, and just to bring that up because uh, of the fear of rabies, um, then the likelihood of a bat having rabies is really, really low. It's less than 0.5%. Um, not to say that you shouldn't take precautions, but just uh, if that lessens your fears, it's, it's extremely rare that a bat would have rabies. Um, and as far as, you know, excluding bats from your house, if you did want to, if you know you have, like my sister in Minnesota had bats in her house, and so did my uncle. He didn't care, but my sister did. Uh, you can, there are ways that you can do it on your own. There's very specific instructions where you're not actually touching the bats at all. Uh, between March 15th and May 15th at dusk when the bats leave, there's a way to just kind of close the door so that the bats can't get back in. Um, and the reason that it's between March 15th and May 15th because it's before the pups are born, because the pups are staying in there. So yeah, but like Jamie said, uh, there's some, I've got some really good websites, but check with the professionals. Bonnie wants to know, does mosquito spraying harm bats? Well, it's, if you're talking about pesticide killing the mosquitoes. Um, I haven't- She means like the city spraying. Oh, um, I would, I, okay. So I haven't seen information on it harming the bat directly, but indirectly, absolutely it does. Because when they are spraying, first of all, mosquito spraying is not very good at killing the mosquitoes, but it's really good at killing um, the dragonflies, the moths, and all these other night flying insects. Um, which is now what just happened. You just totally reduced the number of insects, therefore the number of pollinators, therefore that piece of the food web. And there's really no reason to be spraying for mosquitoes in any municipality, um, unless that's the absolute last resort. And I, where I live, they spray way more than they should. And it should, it should be an absolute last resort. So, yeah, and, and from what I've read, it's not terribly effective that there are actually more effective ways of doing it, but this is kind of the easy way and it makes people feel better, so they do it. Right. And that's, that's what I've been told by, by public officials, that uh, the appearance is good. So it just, right. it, it calms the public down when they see you spraying, but it actually doesn't do much good at all. Right. And it's not, it's not good for the bats because you just took food off of their plate. And exactly. food off of our plate too, because there's pollinators, there's night pollinators out there that pollinating our little vegetable crops in our backyard. All right, Margaret also wants to know, why do we see bats in downtown Chicago? Because there's habitat. As long as there's water and there are big trees, and guess what? Probably big houses or just houses that have attics. Um, that's all habitat maintains the proper temperature control so that they can, you know, be in that space during the day and at night <clears throat> safely make their way out and into the city where there's uh, moths and beetles and Japanese beetles and uh, all kinds of flies. So uh, yeah, that's, it's because there's habitat. And actually yeah. Chicago, I, I've been to some conferences where they talk about the Chicago region and the habitat in the city of Chicago has some areas that are very rich with tree habitat, big tree habitat. So we need our trees. We need to stop cutting them down. We need to find ways to let them stand um, because they're connected to us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, going back to the roosting, um, there was a question, do different species of bats share the same roost? Um, 
I, that's a good question. I came across that in my bat research rabbit hole that uh, sometimes different species will. So where you saw uh, that some bats live in houses, um, those bat species, sometimes there is a, a mixture of different bats that are living in houses. But what I'm not sure of is when you're talking about like maternity roosts, which is just the females and their pups. I could not answer that for you if it's just species specific where that roost is only going to have the big brown bat, moms and pups, or is there a combination? I don't know. That'd be some I'm great research. An answer. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, that would be some great research, you know, and I think a lot of there's a lot that we don't know about them yet just because the research hasn't been done or, you know, we've been limited right. on the research that's available in the different areas. So um, it's really cool always to see all the new stuff that's coming out about them. Right. right. Yeah, there is. A, it, that's the thing. There's so much new research and all you guys being here today and connecting yourself to this information um, is really good. And I hope it goes right, right to the core, right to the heart. And, you know, keep doing the Zooms that our on Conservation Foundation and anywhere else you can find just to inspire you to take action in any way to be sustainable and start reconnecting the threads of the, of the food web. So I'm gonna piggyback a little bit on what you were talking about earlier with native plants because we've done a ton of webinars on native plants and pollinator gardens and stuff like that. If you're interested in more information, definitely check them out on our YouTube channel. We have all that information on there the page that you're going to be taken to once you close out of this webinar. Um, there are resources on there about where you can get native plants. Start planting your gardens now. I know it's kind of the end of the season. Oh yeah. Now's a great time to start planting. Maybe if you're going to start a new area, put your black plastic down to start um, solarizing that patch to clear it out for you. Um, right. But you know, we've got lots and lots of information about all of that too. And um, also on avoiding plants with pesticides as well. Absolutely, um, that, that's key. And it's, it's not like, I'm sure a native plant doesn't have pesticides. You have to ask, you really do. Right. And we just did a Leave the Leaves webinar as well. So if you're Ooh, good. interested in more, you know, if you're not quite there yet, not quite certain you can do it, definitely check out that webinar as well because it's all about how to, how to clean up your garden, a little bit make it look presentable while still having it available for the pollinators. I right. just wanted to end really quick. Uh, May gave us a little story here about seeing bats and, I, and it's kind of cool. I've seen videos of this. I know the Forest Preserve District has put out videos on this too. Uh, but May says, we traveled to Austin, Texas to watch the bats come out from the <sighs> bridge there. Amazing. Out they come so circling, circling higher and higher into the evening sky. We have many bats at Wildlife Prairie Park in Peoria County. As the sun sets, the bats come out from under the shelters in three places inside the park. And it's very cool to see this happen too. Wow. I know there are a couple of shelters in Will County and Forest Preserve properties where uh, bats have roosted and you can see them coming out at night. I know they've gotten videos of it. I've seen them on Facebook, but yeah, that's, it's so cool to see them all coming out for the evening and setting off to go feed. It is, it's so much fun. I can't, I can't, I know like in our forest preserves, we have some old shelters that aren't being used anymore. And um, yeah, you're just out there at dusk, right before the police are closing and they're gonna lock you in. Um, just kind of stand around and see if you can see them or go on a bad hike with us and we'll yeah. take you. To the there places. you go. Yeah. All right. Well, I think with that, we are going to wrap up. And so I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Kate, so much for sharing with us all your bat information. Thank you for inviting me. It was great talking to you again today. Um, and, and thank you all. We hope that you'll, in, you'll join us next week for Inside Conservation with NICOR Gas and American Water. That's yeah. going to be a great one as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you all again next week. Thank you, thank you. Bye, everybody. Take Goodbye, care. Bye, everybody. Care.